So I'll start with a smile. Uh, do this. That way, if you got a chip on your shoulder, you can just get that out of the way now. Um, my notes are in there. Um, I'm going to bring you what the Lord told me to bring you this morning. And uh, I can tell you this without any reservation. I've been preaching over 20 years, and I've preached a verse a certain way for 20 years. And over the last seven to ten days, God has shown me how wrong I preached the verse. How incorrectly I have been on some things. And to be quite honest, he's rebuked me so many times this week. I didn't want to get out of bed and come this morning. Mark almost got a call at 6 a.m. said, you're up today. But I'm going to do what the Lord told me to come and do. So I'm going to share with you from my heart what God has laid on my heart. And I ask you to receive it from the Lord. If it convicts your heart, then I ask you to do something about it. I believe that the tribulation, there is a tribulation and a great tribulation. That's seven years coming. It doesn't matter to me whether you believe that we will be caught out before, during the middle, or after. But I do believe with everything in me that Scripture tells us that there is birthing pains before the tribulation. And I believe that we are beginning, if not already, into the birthing pains in the world of the return of Christ. I believe that we are the last generation that will ever live on this earth. How do I know that? Because Jerusalem is the holy city. After 2,000 years it was not, and now it is again. Israel is a nation, and the Bible tells us that when the nation that becomes a nation that was not a nation, or that was a nation that was not a nation, when that happens, it's the last generation. But I also believe that sometimes we forget what God has called us to do and tells us to do. So pray for me as I pray for you. Father, I pray that I would speak nothing that would harm you. God, I pray that your people would receive from you today in love. But that the agendas that we have that we attach to you as your agenda would be broken off of us and that your agenda would be what matters. Touch all that we do here, the remainder of this service, in your precious name. Amen. Isaiah chapter 59, Isaiah chapter 59, we're going to begin with verse 19. When you have it, stand for the reading of God's word. Isaiah chapter 59, beginning with verse 19. This is scripture that I have preached multiple times in my life. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west. We're the west, by the way, in case you're wondering. And his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. Miss Wendy, will you bless the reading of the word? Amen. You can be seated. The scripture that we begin with literally says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. I've always loved that because I knew when the enemy come against me that God was going to stand up on my behalf. You believe that? Say amen. amen. So God's going to stand up on my behalf. But the Lord took me a little deeper into this scripture this week. And as I begin to do that, there's some points in here I want to show you. Verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 59 says this. He says, here is what I want you to know. This is not the problem. This is not 
the problem. Verse 1 says, and I'll, I'll paraphrase it, it says, God's arm is not short. He will accomplish what he plans on accomplishing. His arm is not short. And his ears can hear. Makes it very clearly. So here's what he's saying. You know why the enemy's running rush shot over the church today? It's not God's fault. Now that's what he says in verse 1. Now we love to hear the part about how God's going to raise up a standard and he's going to put up a flag and he's going to fight on our behalf. But he says the reason the enemy's running rush shot is not God's fault. Verse 2 and 3 and beginning from there down, here's what he says. He says, my people, he's not talking about lost people, he's talking about born again children of God. I understand it's Old Testament, I understand he's speaking to the Jewish people here, but we are the seed of the seed of the seed, we are those people. And here's what he says, he says, my people are fallen into sin, they refuse to raise their standards. They take what they want to believe is okay with God and they justify. What is an example of that? Well, that homosexuality thing. Man, that thing is horrible, horrible. While they're sleeping with someone they're not married to. And they justify that that is okay before God. Men and women of God go to the buffet and they gorge themselves in the name of Jesus. When he said, do not be a glutton. We take a little sip of this or that, and we end up drunk, and we say, well, you know what? God understands. Can I tell you that your Bible says that if you are drunk, that it is a sin against God? Can I say this to you today? In love, we make our own agendas. We post them all over social media. We tell all our friends about them. We hate this one. We hate that one. And it is a stench in the nostrils of God. Here's what God said in this scripture, and I'll continue. He said, I will raise up a standard against the enemy because no one else will raise up a standard. He said, I'm not fighting for you. I'm fighting for my own name. Read the scripture. Read this chapter. He says no one will raise their standards to walk in holiness. When the church was birthed, the church of God, our denomination, it was called a movement, a holiness movement. Now let me make this clear to you. They got into so much legalism that you couldn't wear fingernail polish or you couldn't. They got into legalism which literally began to tear down. But what happened was the pendulum swung the other way and holiness went out the door with it. Do you know in the Old Testament they were required to go to church? Do you know in the New Testament it says, forsake not, yet we make it a second thought whether we'll show up or not. I'm not talking about you directly, but the church in America, when I grew up, the standard was if the doors were open, you showed up. The standard of being a faithful member now is if the doors are open eight times a week, I mean eight times a month, we show up two out of eight and we're faithful. Now, I'm not telling you that you have to be in church, but what I am telling you is this, that God said, I am raising a standard up for myself because my people refuse to raise a standard. They refuse to walk in holiness. They want to do what, they want to hate their neighbor and say, I love God, and he said, it doesn't work that way. And then we cry out, God, fix it, fix it. And you know what? Many times he fixes it. But when the enemy comes in like a flood, you better understand something. God is not going to stand up for those with no standards. God is not going to continue to stand up for those that have no standards. We have nothing to lean on when we don't have standards. And our standards are in God's word. 
and we justify somehow along the way what we want to do is okay with God. What you want to do is not okay with God, but what I want to do is okay with God. Therefore, I justify that. And God said it's a stench in his nostrils that the men and women that he calls his children will not raise up a standard and fight the enemy on their own. They will not say no, no, no. They will not say that no. I was so sick this morning when I got up. Yesterday morning, I was just as sick. Sugar at 400, just rough. But at 5 a.m. yesterday morning, I wanted to go with you. So I crawl out of bed, and I get ready. And I run to the bathroom and back, and I'm sick. And we ride almost to sisters, and we step out in the sun, and we walk 4.79 miles up and down hills, shooting bows. But I don't want to be here this morning because I don't feel good. Where is my standard? I hang out with my friends, and if they don't have holy language, do I allow my language to drop to them? It's sad to say at times I do. And it's a stench in the nostrils of God that as a man of God professing God in my life that I would let my conversation go places. You say, well, it's just among friends. It is not of God. And when God says, I'm going to defeat the enemy, he says, I'm going to do it because no one else will. Because we've given up our standard. See, I don't want to talk about one little drink. You know, the Bible doesn't say you can't have a drink. But the Bible says don't be drunk. And yet we justify it by stress in our lives. We justify hating our neighbor because of what he did to us. And God clearly tells us that you cannot love him and hate your neighbor. But, I, well, that doesn't really apply to me. Old Testament, New Testament, anything on planet earth. I didn't even mention this first service, but he mentioned it to me. He said to me, you know what God convicted me of? I don't have a job, so therefore I'm justifying not giving my tithe. And he said, God said, how can I pour back into you? How can I rebuke the enemy on your behalf if you won't even trust me with it? I know this is old school preaching, isn't it? Your, your daddy would preach stuff like this. But God convicted me this week, and he said, you love things more than you do me, so you justify the things in your life. And you love those things so much, and I want you to have things. But when they become your focus, and I'm no longer... And I've always read this scripture that when the enemy comes and that God's going to raise up a standard and God literally in this text says to his people, I had to raise up a standard for myself because no one would raise up a standard for me. Just a little pornography, right? Eat a chocolate chip cookie with just one little piece of cat poop in it. It's just a little, it's not going to, a little cussing isn't going to hurt anything. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. Can I tell you that God said to his people that you think that you can do what you want and then call on me to move forward? Not shorten, but I will not move my hand on your behalf. I will move my hand on my own behalf. See, that isn't popular preaching, and I understand that. But how many things in your life? have taken control of you that are not of God. How many crusades are you on? I used to say things up until this week of, you know what, I hope her soul goes to heaven, but I hope her body rots right here on earth. And God said, is that my agenda or yours? Is that my standard or is that your standard? We are coming to a time 
in this world that you will choose. And if you don't have a standard set, you have nothing to stand against. And if God said it was sin 2,000 years ago, it's still sin today. I love you enough to tell you the truth. You are not going to split hell wide open even though you accepted Christ, but then you chose to dilly-dally along the way and tiptoe on the line and, and walk in unholiness all the way and expect God to drag you out. And when he says at the end of this scripture, he says, I will raise up a standard against the enemy when he comes in. And then he says, to those that follow me, not half-heartedly, whole Heartedly. We may not have 30 people next week. I'll be all right. I may be washing dogs for a living. I don't know. Church, let me just give you what God said. I'd rather be you ice cold or red hot. Other than that, you're vomit in my mouth. And as I begin to look at your preacher's life, I begin to realize that there's some things in there that are lukewarm that might just make God spew. My desire to make my friends like me override holiness in my life? Come on. My desire to fit in with the world? God will not continue to pull us out if we do not walk in his standard. I love you enough to tell you that. God will not continue, and I'm not talking about somebody that's struggling with something. I'm talking about somebody embracing stuff. And as I begin to read this scripture all the way through that he's had me in for the last seven to ten days, he started with this. He said, I'm not the problem. That's what the first verse says. My arms still work. I still hear everything that's going on. The problem is God's people lowered their standards to meet the standards of the world. We've come to justify whatever we want to justify because it meets my needs. I bought the whole bucket of chicken. I'm eating the whole bucket of chicken. Great, do that over the next three days. We justify things in our life that God said was sin. Period. Period. And we look the other way. But I want you to know something. Speaking from the brokenness of my own conviction... God's at a point where he's tired of looking the other way. He's tired of looking the other way. He's coming back for a white and pure and holy bride. Not a pig rolling in the mud saying it's going to be all right. I've got about 50 scripture in there to back this up if you want my notes. But I want you to ask yourself something today. First of all, if you're lost, you need Christ. But I want you to ask yourself something today. What am I saying okay that God would say is not okay? What am I accepting? Let me give you some of those. Let me help you out. If you're walking in fear, God says it's not acceptable. If you're walking in unforgiveness, God said it's not acceptable. If you're walking in sin, left, right, north, south, east, west, God said, I cannot accept it, and I will stand up, and I will present my name to a world, but I will not take you with me if your standards will not meet my standards. God didn't say that. Read it. Break it down. Some of y'all reading it right now, right? good because here's what I believe 
I believe there's coming a time in the near future when we're going to have to choose between what we love and our love for God. Well, that won't be in our lifetime, won't it, bet? It's coming now. It's coming now. I'm not going to get into details. But you live in a country where we sing about freedom while we're in bondage to sin. We worship God. What about your worship? Do you really worship or is what's going on in your life still your worship? I worship when it's time, when I feel like it. The next time you feel like it might be one time too late. See, I'm not up here beating you up. God's whipped me all week. Coach, I didn't feel like shooting yesterday. You know that. I squatted down in the trail, but I went because I wanted to. And then I can't come to church because I feel no worse than I did yesterday when I'm out in the heat for five and a half hours. And I expect God to bless that. And he says, I ain't doing it for you. I'm protecting my name. Never saw this scripture like this day until this week. And to be honest with you, I liked it the other way better. If your agenda is an agenda of hate, it's not the agenda of God. You can dislike everything going on around you, but if you hate... And you're out to get? And I'll joke with you for a minute. Not all them, just you. But if we started out with, well, well, here you go, we're probably being argumentative, which Christ never did. We did in the temple only with the religious people, not with lost folk. Church, it's time that God's people stand up. I know it's a war. I know it's a fight. I know it's going to be hell in your life. Believe me, I understand that. Because I like to coarse joke just as much as anybody when I'm hanging out with the guys. But it's a stench in the nostrils of God. When I walk in my standards, when it comes to the point where I have to have a standard to walk by, and I didn't have a moral standard to walk by, I'm going to fall by the wayside. And whether you admit that or not, you will too. What are your standards? Whatever God said. Period. If God said no sex outside of marriage, that means no sex outside of marriage. If God said love your neighbor, that means even the one that is cutting down your cherry tree. And as much as I don't like people in this life, God said I have to love them. And I can pretend that I do in my heart, but God knows the truth. God knows where I'm at in my heart. And his standard's the only one that's going to matter. Some of you got grandbabies and you think they are greater than kids. Jason, I'm, I believe my kids are the greatest on planet Earth. Tori's an amazing girl back there, but she's not good enough for Micah, right? And Jimmy would feel the same thing about Micah's not good enough for Tori. And Anna's not good enough for Blake. And nobody's good enough for Becca. But if I value my children more than my God, there must come a place where I have to choose. And if that place comes while I'm alive on this earth, I better have a standard that says, I love you and I will see you on the other side. I better be able to stand. And the only way to stand is to have a standard. What you and I were talking about this morning, well, I can't pay tithes because I got this, 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 and this. God says, well, if that's what the problem is, I can take this, 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 and this. 
So now that's not an issue. I, I'm not talking about money. That's just an example. But here's what I am talking about. Where is your standard in your life? Does it line up with God's or the world you live in today? Where's your standard? Stand with me, if you will. Father, you know I love your people. You know that. And Lord, I didn't come to be mean or harsh. And I know that some think every time they walk through the door, I'm mean or harsh. But God, I know, I know, I know that we've become so relaxed as Christians overall in the world that we are in a dangerous place where you said to your children in the book of Isaiah, it's not me that's not moving, it's you. It's not me, says the Lord, that doesn't have standards. It's you. God, I pray that we get so close to you and that we get the garbage out of our life to the point that you say, I'll fight for that standard. I'll fight for Mark's standards. I'll fight for Stan's standards. I'll fight for Tim's standards. I'll fight for everybody at Harvest Christian Center's standards. But if they have no standards, I'll fight for myself and not them. God, I pray today that we become hungry to follow what you said. You said worship, let us worship with reckless abandon. You said love, let us love with reckless abandon. You said trust, let us trust without fear, without Reckless abandon. Let us cast out what we deep down in our hearts by your spirit know is sin that we've justified for too long. That you can raise up a standard on our behalf to fight the onslaught of the enemy. I pray that your sweet Holy Spirit convicts your people today, Lord. God, I pray that he begins to stir their spirits to want more of you. To stop worrying about what this is and that is and start worrying about who you are. And God, I pray above all else, not one person in this church would leave this world without you. That every man, woman, and child would walk through the doors of heaven on that narrow road. And that they would be welcomed in because they've heard the truth and they've accepted 